Hello everyone, I'm Alessim and in this video I'm gonna show how I made Noble Studio. This will be a technical video I'm to Max developers along with curious people who want to know how those things are made. I won't explain every detail of the device because that will be too much to unfold, but I'm going to show you two aspects of it. The first one is going to be the waveform stuff. And in the second part, I'm going to show you how I handle the randomization. So let's begin from the waveform. To create this part of the device, I use a mixture of gen and JavaScript. As you can see, I use two different gen patches. Although they have pretty much the same code, they handle two different functions. In the first gen patch, the first thing you see are the inputs. There are several divided into four groups and each input represents a single properties of the functions. On the right side, there is a counter. So let me explain one thing first. When calculating the waveform, I need to calculate every single point of the waveform. If you're not familiar with Gen, the code written inside the Gen patch gets executed at every sample. Considering that working at audio rate means having a lot of operation every second, calculating the whole waveform, every single sample will be computationally too expensive. To solve this problem, I calculate just one point of the waveform for every sample. The counter on the top right keeps track of which point I'm calculating and it increments by one every single sample. Now let's see what's written inside the code box. The first thing I did was to define a lot of function that are going to be the actual function that will let me actually draw my waveforms. Taking the scene as an example, it takes j which is the index of the point I'm calculating, the one that we take from the counter, the range and the properties of the waveform. In particular, frac is the number of the cycle, phase is the phase, but also it's the movement of the waveform, and amp is the amplitude. You can notice how I use the cosine function to calculate the sine waveform, and the cosine function is a built-in function. For pretty much all the other draw function, I had to first declare another function equivalent to the cosine one, but that let me draw all the other different shapes. Skipping all the draw function related to the LFO shapes, let's take a look at the draw random one. To be able to have random values, I basically read those values from a buffer. By picking the values from a buffer that contains random values and having this buffer outside my gen patcher, I ensure that I can retrieve those values by using the same seed every time. And also I don't have to keep an internal memory of the random values. So that's how I handle this. And it's basically a super easy shortcut for having random values available. The draw ramp and draw fix function are pretty much straightforward. One thing you can notice is how they still have the same number of inputs, but their meaning change. That's because the meaning of the inputs change every time we are calling a different function. You can also see how inside the draw fix function, I ignore the A and C arguments. Indeed, What's going to tell us which function we are going to pick is going to be the first input of every group of inputs. And we're going to pass this information to the select function function. The last function defined is the join function that let us calculate the risk value value when two functions overlap. Join takes two ranges as inputs and if they overlap, is going to tell me how much I have to rescale the fade out function and how much I, I need to rescale the fade in function. After defining the various function, I declare two buffer. The first one is just a link for the random buffer that I mentioned before. The second one is the buffer that actually contains the waveform we are calculating. As you can see, there's no output for the gen patcher. The actual output of 
this wall operation is the data inside this buffer. Also, I declare a temporary array of the same size of the waveform buffer. Here, finally, begin our operation. First thing, I calculate every point of every function and I store those values inside the A, B, C and the variables. Then I use the join function to calculate the values of A and B in the given J slice. If in this slice there's nothing to calculate, I just return zero. Maybe my function are in other ranges. If just one function is present in this slice, I just return the value. Otherwise, if two functions are present in this slice, I do the join calculation. Then I save the result of this calculation inside the a, b variable, and then I repeat this process with a, b and c. After that, I do the same thing with a, b, c and d. And finally, I do have my a, b, c, d value, which is the value of the point in this section of the waveform. I repeat the whole process for the whole waveform. Keep in mind that I'm going forward one point for every sample. And every time I calculate one value, I store it inside the data array. And finally, after it did a complete cycle, I copy the value of the temporary array inside the waveform buffer, and that's it. Now that my buffer contains my waveform, I use a JSUI patch to actually display this waveform. And one fun fact is that I rewrote this code like five times, and the first times I did all the calculation inside JavaScript, but that was like too slow for doing things in audio rate, at least in this case. Now that we do have our waveform displayed, let's see how I actually read the values from this waveform. And I do that inside the mc.gen patcher instead, where I do have pretty much the same exact code. What changes is that instead of having a counter, I do use uh, an external value that correspond to the actual position of the reading heads. And in this way, I ensure that I do have the exact value every single sample. And so my waveform is smooth and ready to be mapped around. That was it for the waveform part. Now let's talk about randomization. As you know, inside Knob Studio, you can randomize the whole function part of the device by pressing a single button. Moreover, you can also change how this randomization behaves. Imagine having to manage generating a whole series of random values, all of them with the do condition, ranges, cases, if, else, etc. Using Max, it will lead to spaghetti code quickly and also it will be really hard to maintain over time. My take in this case is to use JavaScript instead. I'm not going into details about how I wrote the JavaScript code for the randomization part because that will be unnecessary. But I wanted to dedicate this part of the video just to say that if you have to do something similar and you don't want to handle a lot of crazy max patching, you can use JavaScript instead. Learning to write JavaScript inside Max leads to a huge boost in so much cases, especially in cases like this one, where you do have a lot of conditions and also you want to leave yourself the possibility of expanding the code or modify it in future without going crazy. An incredible resource for learning JavaScript is LearnX in Y minutes that along with the Max documentation will provide you all you need to know for reading JavaScript code inside Max. And that's it. I hope you found value in this video. If you have further questions or just want to say hi, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email. 
I'm more than happy to share what I know with you and everyone. And that's it. Bye.